Hi, Dacker. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Doing well. How about you? Good. I can't complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Dacker Keltner. Uh, you're a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley. You are also the author of uh, Born to be Good, The Science of a Meaningful Life. And speaking of the science of a meaningful life, I think you're the founder probably of the Greater Good Science Center or a founder or something, which yeah. is an online resource for people who want to lead uh, a meaningful life. You are also, you direct the Berkeley, what is it, the Social Interaction Lab. Right. Which kind of brings us to this book, this brand new book by you, The Power Paradox, uh, How We Gain and Lose Influence, um, just out, uh, hot off the presses, fascinating book, and uh, you are the perfect person to write it. And I didn't totally realize this, because although I've uh, followed your work for some years, as you know, it hadn't occurred to me that a lot of the work you've actually done yourself, you know, experiments, you know, in the lab or out out in the wild, um, are about how people g get power and or how having power influences people, right? Yeah. Uh, turns out, So this is kind of a, a, a grand summing up, although uh, commendably brief, as grand <laughs> summing ups go. You know, not not a burdensome weight at all. Very good read. Unlike um, my friend Bob over there. So <laughs> what's that? Unlike somebody I know I'm speaking. Hey, hey, let's don't get personal. Let's don't start the mudslinging yet. Uh, I try to keep them short. It just <laughs> hasn't happened. Uh, so now here's what I think. I think obviously the question on everybody's mind is what is the power paradox? I think we should leave them on the edge of their seats for a little while. I like it. And I mean, what we can say, I think, is that the paradox emerges when you compare how it is people go about gaining power with what kinds of effects having power, you know, ha what, what kind of effect that has on people. Right. Uh, and, and we'll leave it at that for now okay. and start at square one and talk about what power is, how people do get it, how they yeah. do lose it, what effect it has on them and, and so on. So... How, what, what is, what is power? How are you defining power? Well, I mean, in, in many ways, uh, thanks for the summing up, Bob. I mean, that was one of the most challenging and I think important parts of this, this project is what is power, right? And if you ask people out in the world, they'll say it's money. They'll think it's social class. They'll think it's Kim Kardashian or fame or what have you. Uh, if you consult the social sciences, uh, and psychology was late to the game in thinking about what power is. You, you go to history and it's military might, you go to economics, it's money, Poli political science, obviously it's access to the political process. And to me as a psychologist, that just didn't, that didn't answer any of the interesting questions, right? Uh, what are the power dynamics between husband and wife or romantic partners or parents and kids? Um, how do we think about power in terms of really striking historical changes like here at Berkeley, the free speech movement, which, you know, in many ways went from a philosophy student, Mario Savio, talking about free speech to, and his influences in the, uh, the, the um, civil rights movement to anti-war protests around the world. So it just, so to put it all together, and a lot of social scientists have grappled with this, and I think the consensus is that it really is about altering the state of another person or people, right? You, you keep at that level of generality, and then you can start to address interesting questions like, wow, Lady Gaga has a massive influence or a lot of power on the psyche of America. Mm -hmm. um, so I define it as uh, our capacity to alter the state of another person. Okay. So influence, which can be mediated in all kinds of ways. Right. And I think you emphasize in the book um, how much of a kind of a social phenomenon it is in the sense that, you know, you can exert influence indirectly uh, on people. You can exert it through networks. And it's not all it's not all face to face by any means. Yeah. No, and this is really important. So, you know, like Michel Foucault and other people had to say Michel Foucault, by the way. Yeah, well, good. Now you can follow that up by characterizing something uh, he said in a way that I will understand. That would be a first. So go <laughs> ahead. The field is open to you. <laughs> but he, you know, early on, he said power is exercised in distributed social networks, right? And this was 
30, 40 years ago when he said this. And I think that's, pr that's prescient and true, which is when we think about what we do in the world, how we influence the world, it really goes through other people, friends, work colleagues, family members, and so forth. Uh, so yes, it is social and it's distributed and, and it's not as much inside our head as in what do we get other people to do. Okay. And it may or may not correspond with formal rank or, you know, very overtly recognized leverage. It can, it can, it can, you can, yeah. there are a lot of ways to be powerful. In this yeah. And, and this is where the empirical science is so important, Bob. And I know you always keep an eye on the empirical science. So we, we developed a measure how, Hey, how much power do you have? How much influence do you have? How much do people listen to what you have to say or act upon what you recommend that they do? Standard, sensible measure of my sense of power. And so, for example, with respect to rank, it's correlated modestly with your, the title of your position, but not much. It's correlated about 0.1 with how much money you have. So money doesn't necessarily directly translate to power. It's kind of correlated with gender, but not like we would think it would. So that tells us power is much more complicated uh, and multiply determined than just, hey, I'm a, this is my title or this is where I'm in the organizational chart. So it's okay. much more complex. Okay. So now for one of the big questions, how do we get power? How do people wind up being more powerful than the average person? Yeah, you know, this was striking. And, and this was where the science really... Uh, really challenge kind of my preconceptions. So like most Western Europeans, I knew of the prince, Machiavelli's philosophy of power, uh, which he wrote in a particular historical moment after he had been kicked out of Florentine politics and was depressed, probably. Uh, I think that's consequential. And, uh, you know, the Machiavelli philosophy is like, it's force and fraud, right? Which is you force people to do things you lie, you deceive. I see you're already smiling mischief. With you. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking and, of ways I can apply this. Keep talking. I hope you're going to say, and he was right, so I can apply these valuable lessons, but I suspect you may be not yeah. poised to say that. Go ahead. Exactly. You know, you, you know the argument. So, you know, that, you know, that philosophy is 500 years old. It, it, it may have worked in Florence in the Renaissance period, but it, it just doesn't work today. And how we gain power it's through all these socially intelligent practices, right? Very simply, what I make the case for in the book, and I think it's a, a good way to sum it up, is we get power to the extent we advance the greater good, right? So whatever social network I'm part of in that moment, I have power if I'm really advancing people's interests uh, in different ways. And we do that, and then there are these more micro studies of I do it by practicing empathy and knowing what people think. I do it by really counterintuitively sharing a lot of resources, right? Um, I do it through uh, Adam Grant has got a lot of cool stuff coming out in organizations. Like I do it through gratitude and giving. So it's a much more pro-social view of power than Machiavelli and stands up pretty well in terms of data. And, and talk about some of the data, whether it's field studies in hunter-gatherer societies or lab things you've done or whatever. What is, what, give us a sense for the diversity of, yeah. of evidence you're talking about. Yeah, you know, so it, it begins, you know, as, as I started to grab, so, you know, I did my own small studies. I studied kids in summer camps, who, who's judged by their peers to be really the cool kid. I studied, uh, you know, people in sororities, fraternities, dorms. We just did a paper on U.S. senators during the Clinton era and who gets stuff done, right? who has influence. And those studies all converged on this idea that it's really the person who's advancing the interests of others, who's building ties, who's really open to ideas, who rises in the ranks. Then there's this review. This really persuaded me, Bob. You know, 70, 80 studies in military units, financial advising firms, schools, workplaces, and it's those same attributes of empathy and, you know, sharing and open-mindedness. And, you know, I know you take studies of hunter-gatherers very seriously. I do too, right? I mean, these are the basic structures of our evolution. And Christopher Bum has this incredible summary from, I think, 1991. He says, you know, the leader in different continents in these hunter-gatherer societies 
resembling the conditions in which we evolved is fair and impartial and a good listener and courageous in battle. So it's not all Berkeley soft stuff, you know, is kind and shares and so forth. So there are a ton of data that support this thesis. Uh, you can even push it back into chimps, right? And Franz de Waal, you look closely at who he thinks rises in the chimpanzee hierarchies, and it's fairly similar. It's this, I'm good for the group and advancing the interests of the group. Mm -hmm. Now, you um, <clears throat> talk a little about some of the dorm, the dorm studies. I mean, you, these were like kind of year-long things, right? Where you, yeah. you followed students like before any kind of a power structure had coalesced, so, yeah. you know, beginning before, and then you followed them through and, and, and you found specific things to be correlated with, you know, specific things found in the people who were judged to have influence by the end of the... Yeah. So, you know, one of the, one of the challenges, and it's so great to dig deep into this, one of the challenges of studying how you get power is... You know, history endows our identities with so many, you know, the minute we're born, right? We're living in a neighborhood. We have a certain color of skin. Uh, you know, we come from a class background. Our parents have their background. I mean, it's tough to really do the pure tests of how we gain power. Um, and I, I write about it. You know, this is a long a, a philosopher's kind of uh, linchpin, which is the natural state experiment. Like, if you just draw people into a context, what happens? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. Um, we have tried that and we, in a couple of studies, so one of them at the University of Wisconsin, which interestingly, uh, in the 90s was fairly middle class, you know, kind of, demo, you know, just sort of a, a sampling of people in terms of class background, some ethnic variation. We just, they arrive at college, they're randomly assigned to a dorm, um, and then we figure out, uh, we track them. From the first week, we measure who's got power, right? And then we follow their power over the course of the year. Here's what's really interesting. Um, within a week, people start settling into social hierarchies, right? Uh, and other studies have shown it happens within, you know, 20, 30 minutes. We kind of settle in. Uh, those people kind of stay in a fairly similar place in the hierarchy over the course of the year. And then we're in this great position to say, in this really kind of similar environment, um, who gains power? And again, it's the, the person who's really socially engaged, they're more cooperative, they are pretty calm, they handle stress well, they're really open to good ideas, they, they're really generative. Uh, it, and that pattern replicates, as we've already seen, so it gives us confidence. Doesn't, doesn't having power kind of help you handle stress better in a certain sense? I, I mean, there are changes brought about, and we'll get to most of this later in yeah. the conversation, the changes that are brought about by having power. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, the, the uh, I'm thinking partly of these, you know, serotonin-boosting drugs that, that can make people, you know, more, more, more calm and more calmly assertive sometimes. Yeah. So, and that seems to reflect the our brains having been built to acclimate themselves to different places in the social hierarchy or different places in the power structure and act accordingly, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, in fact, you know, Bob, what you just said right there, that the brain is designed and by implication organized hierarchy in terms of social hierarchy, you know, that, that was actually my beginning point to study power in the first place. As I looked at neuroscience and the evolution of emotion, and there was no real systematic treatment of hierarchy. And you're absolutely right. The, there are certain big systems in the brain that are very sensitive to your position in a social hierarchy, both low, the cortisol system for one, and then high, right? Certain SSRIs, for example. There's a really cool study to your question of Brian Knudsen showing when people take SSRIs and they're calmer and handle stress better, they feel more powerful. Right. They kind of like, hey, man, I got the good. So uh, so absolutely right. The brain is very attuned to hierarchy. OK. Now, as for this, you know, the, the, the power structure in a dormitory, <clears throat> I think some people looking back on college might recall <laughs> other things being relevant, like just the good looking, you know, yeah. the, uh, being good looking, being athletic. That yeah. it certainly uh, seems to accord someone 
status. And that, yeah. you know, you can get into the question of to what extent status is the same as power. But right. it d- does seem like you give people a certain kind of leeway when they're like the great athlete or, yeah. the, you know, the beautiful or handsome, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, you know, and this is the complexity, right? So what we're talking about thus far are your social strategies. Are you engaging with people? Are you cooperating? Are you generating cool ideas or novel ideas? That gets you power. And then in our study, um, the dorm study, how physically attractive you are does gain you a little bit of power, not too much. And that fits a lot of evolutionary thinking that you're, you've written about, you know, which is, wow, the beautiful, perhaps it correlates with different kinds of genetic propensities. So, so that gets you power. Uh, physical stature matters in the power literature. It's overstated. Um, you know, taller presidents tend to win, although the proportion isn't as high as people think. Um, you know, so there, it's, it's just this multiply determined process. But I think, you know, the big story is the social strategies are, are the primary driver, at least in many contexts in the United States. So, the, so to the extent that people are asking, like, what can I do to get power? Yeah, and and assuming they're not contemplating plastic surgery or anabolic steroids that make them a better athlete, then you would focus yeah. on this business of doing things for the group or for people, yeah. performing services for the group in some yeah. sense or another. Yeah, and and you know it's it's so interesting there, and and you know the 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 degree to when I started this work and started teaching this to government leaders and business leaders and tech and so forth, there, there's just this cultural truism of nice guys finish last, compassions for suckers, you know, sharing and cooperation is a weak social strategy. And all of the data today suggests just the opposite, right? That cooperation, you've written about this, is a strong social strategy and builds up strong social collectives. Sharing is a strong power acquiring social strategy. There's a new literature called competitive altruism in the economic games tradition showing the more I share, the, the better my rank goes, right? Um, and, and kindness gets you status and, and power as well. There's just a paper out <laughs> literally last month and, I, and people send me these papers showing, you know, kinder teenagers do better in terms of getting dates. Think about that one, Bob. So, so that uh, was my mistake. <laughs> oh, man. We can talk about that later. Okay. But, but you know, <laughs> wow, that really struck a chord with you, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's really, I'm just revisiting. The nasty journalist. Ages in Hunt- 13 through 18, and it's, I'm, not, I'm not enjoying it. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, now there's a, um, you talk a little about how groups kind of keep powerful people honest in a certain sense. Yeah. Right. I mean, what groups provide incentives for people to have power to keep being nice. Yeah. So this is, this is really under specified in our, our thinking about power. You know, you think about like, if you read biographies of the great leaders, right. Or you, the whole leadership literature, you probably don't read it. I don't really read it. Uh, it, It tends to be about, you know, special people and the social traits they have and so forth. But, but the real action in power is in the give and take between the individual and the social collective. And I remember, you know, since uh, you appreciate the, the scholarship behind things, uh, you know, Christopher Bum summarizes hierarchical dynamics of, I think it's 48 hunter-gatherer societies. And he talks about this, that groups, A, give people power, and I think that's true. And then B, there are these really cool dynamics which between how the groups give you power and constrain your power and then how you behave in a position of leadership. So he talks about things like, for example, if you start abusing power in hunter-gatherer societies, you're prone to gossip. Um, you're prone to exile. They'll abandon you they'll conk you on the head and leave you by the river, right? So groups are continually constraining and, and dictating the, the terms of your power. Mm-hmm. And I think we lose sight of that in thinking about our power today, but it's, it's everywhere, right? It's in the, how journalism constrains politicians. It's in 
how gossip in a workplace kind of keeps in check the abuses of power. So it's a really rich idea of how groups give us power. So you, you have a higher uh, opinion of gossip than some people. I do. And, I, and, you know, it's so funny because, you know, I get, uh, you know, I'm a father of two daughters. They've just navigated the, the teen years. And, boy, gossip in a 13-year-old clutch of girl, young girls is tough stuff, you know. Uh, but the empirical data are really clear that, you know, and, and frankly, uh, gossip's always been with us. You know, it is a human universal it is uh, a source of great writing and journalism. Ben Franklin was the first gossip columnist in the United States. Um, and, and, and himself the, a source of uh, a gossip, as I understand his private life. But. <laughs> exactly. Uh, probably an irony he didn't quite anticipate. Um, and, you know, the lab studies show if you get a group of people together and they have to they're put in a situation where they can give some resources to each other or keep it for themselves and screw other people over, they'll be better citizens if they gossip about each other, right? If they have that capacity. So notwithstanding the problems of gossip, uh, it does speak to this very important process of keeping an eye on other people's reputations, you know, being capable of punishing people uh, as a way to constrain the abuses of power. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be people out here listening to this so far who are thinking you have like a naive view of power, a sunny view of yeah. power and how it's acquired. It's certainly a, a less cynical view than we sometimes hear. And, and by way of addressing these concerns, I mean, one thing I might ask is, isn't it the case that strictly speaking, to become powerful, strictly speaking, you don't have to be nice, you just have to be perceived as nice. No, in other words, I mean, they, they, you need to give the impression to people that you're doing some good, which isn't necessarily the same as actually doing good, right? So yeah, that's, I, a, that's one issue. Yeah, but, and I think that's, that probably is true. You think about, you know, how people rise in power through um, charitable giving, right? You're at a, you know, the well-to-do people are giving a lot of money and rising in their status. Mm -hmm. And that could have multiple intentions behind the act that aren't necessarily kind. So I agree with you there. And, that, and I think it's also possible that, you know, and Machiavelli wrote very explicitly about this, that I could dissemble, I could pretend that I care about the common people and not care at all and, and rise. And, and your listeners probably have their own historical examples, you know, Bush Cheney or what have you, that, that map onto that. Um, you know, I, I think that's certainly possible. It's even more possible when you think about mediated communication. In face-to-face -face social groups, which I study, it's a little harder to fake this stuff. Mm -hmm. right? In small groups. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you, you, know, you know, I do a lot of work on the vocal, facial, physiological signatures of kindness. And that is an old mammalian system that's hard to move around whenever you want. So, uh, but yeah, I think, it's, I think there are opportunities to exploit it. Okay. Um, and I think the other way to, uh, to address people's questions as to whether your view about power shouldn't be more cynical is to maybe segue to the second big question, which is how does having power influence people? We've talked about what kind of person you, you, you need to be to get power, especially in small groups maybe, but then there's the question of what kind of person having power may turn you into. Yeah. And this is where we start getting to, to, to the title of your book, The Power Paradox. Yeah, you know, and I think that, you know, one way to think about addressing, you know, it's so interesting, Bob. Um, I've taught this for 15, 20 years, you know, to people running parts of Google or big, you know, tech labs, government agencies. And, and for the most part, they're like, yeah, I get this. You know, this makes sense. You know, social groups are fairly reasonable for the most part. There are the Hitlers and... Stalins and Mussolini's and, you know, the dictators of the world who, who really violate these principles uh, for the most part. Um, and, um, you know, the, I would get objections like, you know, you know, and I say this in all candor, uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I'd be like, what about Dick Cheney? You know, he manipulative, deceptive, tons of deception in that administration. And I think, I, you know, I think 
he illustrates uh, how we think about the cynical view, which is there are people who abide by different principles and they succeed in the short term. And then if there are certain social systems, they will uh, struggle in the long term in terms of gaining influence. And I think historians will rank that presidency as problematic. Joseph Nye at Harvard, one of the real pioneers in thinking about other forms of power, smart power or soft power, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. notes like after shock and awe, you know, we lost a lot of power. So yeah. you can yeah. think about the cynical view in terms of short term, long term uh, as a way to handle that. So, but the other way to think about this is the, the um, nasty stuff of power actually, upon careful scrutiny, isn't how you get there. It's what power does to you. Right. right. And, you know, we, there are over a few hundred peer review studies, you know, and the picture is not pretty. <laughs> and, you know, if, if I get a little bit of power in an experiment, you put me in charge, right? Or if I come into the experiment and I'm from a life of wealth and privilege, um, you know, I swear more, I cheat on tests, I steal stuff, I take candy from kids. Yeah, that was, a, that was you know, there was a part of your book where you list, like, documented <laughs> things that people are more likely to do when they have power, and that was a, a memorable point you said, literally more yeah. likely to take candy from children. Now, tell us about the little experiment that that's based on. It's ridiculous, you know. So we started to do this work on how privilege and wealth, you know, when you're just born into a life of privilege and wealth, might it bias you to more unethical behavior. And we did all these studies of like, you know, if you're privileged and wealthy, you're more likely to cheat on a gambling task to win 50 bucks. If you're privileged and wealthy, we do this study that some of your listeners may have heard about. We stop at a pedestrian zone in California where the pedestrian has the right of way to cross the street. Uh, drivers of poor cars, right? Plymouth satellites, Yugos, and all kinds of good stuff. Yeah. Stop all the time. Drivers of the wealthy cars, Range Rovers, BMWs, and the like, they blaze through the pedestrian zone, 46.2%. Well, I can proudly report that I used to drive a Plymouth satellite, by the way, which is totally <laughs> consistent with a kind of... So did I. <laughs> respectful and considerate person that I am. But, but yeah, okay, so that so yeah. you, you actually showed rigorously yeah. that it's not your imagination. Like, when I'm driving down the street and I think, oh, a jerk in a BMW, <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> you that... are right. Uh, and also, I might add, we got a lot of mail on this one. You know, well, I drive a Prius, and, you know, I suspect the Prius is, uh, you know, I, I'm uh, sort of, I avoid these sort of moral lapses. We analyze the data. Yes, again. They're the worst. <laughs> Priuses are worse than BMWs in terms of their, their disrespect for pedestrians? Yes. So, so you know, the, one of the clinchers in that work was um, Paul Piff, my, my collaborator. We got people just to think for a moment about the, the coming from a life of privilege by comparing themselves to people really poor, and it kind of boosts your sense of your privilege. Mm -hmm. As they're leaving the experiment, there is a bowl of candy. And on the bowl, it says, for the children of IHD, the Institute of Human Development. Mm -hmm. And our privileged people took more of those candies than our poor people. Bad news. And, and so that's a good, that, that, that's interesting because that's not, I mean, when you're just looking at drivers of cars, for all you know, they were born to that privilege. In any event, they probably right. had right. it for a while. And in yeah. this case, you just manipulated in the lab the sense of how privileged people feel, the sense of how relatively powerful they feel, where they feel they belong in the social hierarchy. And that altered people's tendency to take candy from children. And that's why psychology is important, Bob, because, you know, we know empirically your sense of privilege and, and power or lack thereof really fluctuates, right? You hang around well-to-do writers, you might think differently of yourself than, mm -hmm. than others, et cetera. And, and, and the data really bear that out. All you have to do is give people a little sense of power or make them feel that in that moment they're doing really well financially and you get these abuses of power. I have to tell you, one of my other favorites, uh, you know, once we started publishing this work, people started sending me findings, right? And this guy sent us this paper where it was a nationally representative sample 
of shoplifting, which costs the American economy billions of dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Guess who's more likely? <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Who's more likely to shoplift? What, rich people shoplift more than poor people? <laughs> but they don't go to jail for it. <laughs> it's absurd, you know. I mean, they're, you know, it, it defies economics and, you know, any sort of rational assessment of human behavior. So, uh, and, it, and it just goes on. Uh, a great study from Holland, um, wealthy people and organizations are much more likely to have sexual affairs. You know, just the, the findings keep coming, and it really tells us something about the now perils that, that, of power. That makes sense in Darwinian terms. I mean, in Darwinian terms, one of the main points of pursuing status and power is to convert yeah. it into reproductive currency. Right. Right. Yeah. And that, there's a, a paper uh, really underappreciated where the guy looked at all mammals um, and, and that holds. Like the higher you are in the hierarchy, yeah. you have more offspring, period. So, yeah. so that's a sensible insight. Now, what about empathy? There's work on, on, you know, how you can manipulate, artificially manipulate people's sense of, you know, kind of their self-esteem or their sense of where they belong in the hierarchy and, and, and actually influence their deployment of empathy, right? Yeah, and this was, you know, in a way, this was a um, kind of the first signal of the power paradox that the stuff we use to get power vanishes once we have power. So, Stefan Cote, uh, other scientists were finding, you know, this is Danny Goldman's thesis in a way, like, hey, if I'm a really thoughtful student of other people, I'll gain status and power. And that's true empirically. Mm -hmm. And then there started to hit be these studies. One of my favorites is Adam Belinsky and Joe McGee. You know, you get people to feel powerful in an experiment. And then all they have to do is draw an E on their forehead so the person across from them can read it really easily. And so what that means is you have to break your habit and reverse it to draw it from their You have, you have to put yourself in their shoes and go, oh, wait a second. If I'm them, then I'm reading it from there. So I can't just... If I draw an E in my head, it'll be an E that's backwards to them. So if I'm going to draw an E that's intelligible to them, it's going to have to be backwards to me. And that, just doing that little manipulation is something you're better at if you have less power or less of a sense of your power. You do. And, and so they published that, you know, high power people have five, six times the trouble doing that task. And then you get into other studies. We did papers showing uh, upper class individuals, uh, both their own sense of wealth, and then when we manipulate it, as you've described, they have more trouble reading emotion from people's faces, right? And, and I think when you survey across the studies, power makes us lose about 15% of the social in information in our environment. Um, we just don't know people's thoughts as well. We don't know what their emotions are. We don't know what their intentions are. And that's problematic in terms of using power well. Right, you just have less information about the social it, it, world. It, it makes a certain kind of sense to me, in the sense that I mean, again, if you view the brain as this thing that's engineered to adjust its functioning to where it is in the hierarchy, um, I would think you can get away with a little more of that. I mean, if you look at a boss and a subordinate, yeah, it's like the subordinate is spending more time reading the nuances of the boss's expression yeah. than the boss's and subordinates. And in a way, it makes sense from both of their points of view. The subordinate needs to be responsive uh, yeah. to the whims of the boss in a way that the boss doesn't need to be responsive to the whims of the subordinate. So you, you could say, now, of course, this isn't to say this is a good thing, a socially good thing or a desirable yeah. thing. But in terms of just Darwinian adaptation, it kind of doesn't shock me that once yeah. people have power, you know, like if a president is giving a speech... That, well, they can't afford to be obsessing over every little, you know, the expression of every person in the room. And, and in a sense, it, it, it's not, not a shock, I guess, and, you know. It's, it's not, but, but it gets serious, Bob, you know. So, and, and absolutely, you know, I got this hypothesis from early studies of primates and kids, where non-human primates, where they're finding, it's called the visual attention uh, structure hypothesis, where who we attend to is just driven by power. Right, low power people, right. more careful, and they're attending to high power people. It's a very basic law of how hierarchy in the evolutionary sense drives how we think about other people. But here's what happens and what unfolds, right? Uh, given that, given that I'm not as atten attending as carefully to you, um, 
studies show high power people are more likely to stereotype other people. So if I'm a high power member of an organization, I may make a, a racist slip. I may think of somebody from their ethnic category rather than their individual characteristics. You can start to get into trouble really quickly when you're, you're losing that quality. And you know, I love this quote about uh, Abe Lincoln uh, from Thurlow Weed, who is this journalist who kind of tracked Lincoln's career, really studied him up close. He said, you know, his signature genius was that he listened to everybody who mm -hmm. approached him. Mm -hmm. uh, he just took people in as his, his political Well, genius. and you know what they say about Bill Clinton, and I actually have been, and I have had a short conversation with Bill Clinton, and what everyone says is true, is that when, when he's talking to you, you feel like you're the most important person in the room and the only person in the room. He is totally focused. Yeah. And yeah. and that's, I, I wouldn't say that all politicians are like that, but it's clearly a, a gift that, that pays off politically yeah. in terms of helping you have power if yeah. people perceive you that way, perceive you as... as being focused and, and you emphasize the business of, of being focused on other people as a way to to get power yeah yeah absolutely I mean I think that that's and that's the real peril of and that starts to help us understand why high power people are taking candy and shoplifting and flirting too inappropriately and you know on down the line is they're they're still focused but they kind of get a little bit more interested in their own desire right and and so we lose focus on the outside world Okay, so we've gotten to kind of the paradox part of the power paradox, and you kind of stated it a few minutes ago. It's basically that, like, the things that got you the power, you tend to start losing once you have the power, in your view, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, what I do in the book is I break it down into some really important sort of social strategies. You get power by sharing resources. We've talked about that. And then once I have power... I tend to hoard stuff, right? You get power by empathy uh, and compassion. And then once you have power, you show these compassion deficits. One of our most striking demonstrations, we blasted people with images of kids suffering from cancer. I mean, they are like full-blown suffering images. We measure the vagus nerve, which is a, a physiological response to suffering, right? It's where your heart rate slows and you tear up, that's the vagus nerve, and our poor people showed a strong vagus nerve response, and our wealthy students showed no response. So you get these compassion deficits. Another realm that's really interesting, it's very relevant to today, frankly, the political climate is uh, hot, low power people are great practitioners of polite, considerate language. They are more artful in how they construct phrases, they're more indirect in their requests, they, they really are worried about offending, right? Mm -hmm. High power people tend to be, they tend to violate the rules of civility, right? And there's, a, there's work in organizations showing, if you want to know who's swearing at colleagues, interrupting people, cutting people off, you, you look to the high power. Right. So, yeah, so that's our paradox, is, is uh, the stuff that gets us there vanishes once we're there. Right. And so, uh, like you quote, uh, in the book, you quote both Machiavelli and Lord Acton. Machiavelli famous for saying it's more important to be feared than to be loved. Lord Acton saying power corrupts. And you basically say, in these regards, at least, Machiavelli yeah. was wrong. Lord Acton was right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, on balance, uh, the corrupts hypothesis uh, wins mm -hmm. and, and accounts for a lot of the big you know, effects of power that I review in The Power Paradox. And, you know, so it begs the question of what do we do? Yeah. yeah, and it would be nice to think that, like, the feedback mechanisms you talk about that operate particularly in small groups, yeah. where if somebody abuses their power, there's blowback, you would yeah. like to think that they operate efficiently in all contexts, but they probably don't. I mean, yeah. a, a, a modern uh, society, you know, mediated by various laws and mass media and social media and blah, blah, blah. This is very different from a hunter-gatherer society. And that may <clears throat> help account for the fact that uh, most people could probably think of somebody that has held on to power for some time and is a yeah. jerk. You know, yeah. I, I once talked to a guy who was a, a real kind of Washington operative. He had been around Democratic circles in particular, Democratic Party circles, and he said, 
<laughs> I've never met a national politician, <coughs> by which he meant like a senator or maybe a congressman as well, he said, who was not an asshole. Uh, and now, that may be a slight exaggeration, but this guy, I would not totally dismiss his no. testimony. Yeah. So you, yeah. you acknowledge there is a there is a problem here. You you can, you know, your comeuppance does not come immediately once you get the power and get corrupted by it, right? Yeah, no, and and I think that you know this is where uh, political science does better work for us, right? Which is, I think when you know in the face to face context that I study, there are basic mechanisms that we that keep the powerful in check. You know, one is a concern over reputation, very powerful. The second is gossip and commentary and crit criticism, very powerful. Mm -hmm. A third is, um, you know, do you do you have a so? And this is fundamental, which is alliances and social net networking ties, right? And if those things are in place, we we do a pretty good job of keeping the powerful honest, right? Account commenting on their behavior, letting them know their reputations at stake, having alliances to counter that. And when I when you encounter abuses of power that where people keep their power, you see some of those systems annihilated by the powerful, right? Mm -hmm. They knock out the, the the ties between people. They they disengage opportunities to critique. Um, and so I think that's one way to think about it. And then there, of course, there are going to be violate exceptions to every so-called rule. And you know, if I did my research in Putin's Russia. I think it would look a lot different. Yeah, at the political level. Yeah. And I'm sure that this particular political season must have led you to give some thought to Donald Trump as an interesting, uh, an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. You know, well, well go ahead. He's, he's a joke. You know, I mean, he's not a joke. He's, <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish. You know, it's almost comical because as, you know, this book was getting put into print, you know, just every day I was just like, oh, my God, <laughs> he's... He's like a walking paradox. And so to me, what's striking is two things. You know, the first is you have, you know, as I started to think about Trump, and I know you know this work, Bob, like the, the findings that uh, poor white people are living shorter lives mm -hmm. than their parents. And it's the only demographic group that that's true about in the industrialized world. Mm -hmm. right? It tells us, man, there is a lot of, Right. antipathy in this country and Trump captured it but he you know you just take all the abuses of power and and he just you know you go racism sexism now the New York Times is saying he he you know was inappropriate with women three wives really abandoning kids bad business deals greed he's done them all uh, and and I think in the long run he's gonna hurt that group that he represents yeah but I think you you touched on something. I mean, you write about the life expectancy. Apparently, his support, uh, region by region, is inversely correlated with the life expectancy of white males in those yeah. regions, where where the life expectancy is lowest, his support is the highest. And I think you know one thing that points to is you know we think wait a second, you said that people get power by doing good things. This guy's a jerk. But there are these people who are convinced that he's actually going to do 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 their their bidding. Yeah. That, that he's night he's being nice to them he's carrying their water for them he may or may not but yeah. but, but that is the certainly the belief that is the perception and, and I think that's underappreciated about Trump to be quite honest you know um, uh, I grew up in a neighborhood in, in my um, grammar school years in very poor rural area where people were dying young and and they were deeply frustrated, and and it, and those folks uh, had they had I been there today, or had Trump been a candidate back then, they would have said, "This guy is taking on Jeb Bush, who I'm sick of, and he's taking on he's mentioning taxes for hedge fund guys, and that is an act of empathy in all oddity." <laughs> so and foreign and and competition for your job from immigrants, competition for your job from yeah. tra international trade, and and you know there's. He's clearly, you know, hitting some buttons. And then there's also an interesting thing that I thought of when you talked about, um, you know, how people, uh, you know, power leads people to focus less on other people and so on. I mean, one thing that does is 
is mean that when you see someone behaving like that, you take that as a sign of power, right? Yeah. I, I mean, and sometimes that can help them, at least in yeah. the short run. It's like, wow, he's acting like a powerful guy. And I think yeah. Trump does a lot of that, right? It's like, whoa, well, he must he must have something on the ball. He's acting like a totally powerful guy. He's mean to people. You know, he's he he, he seems fearlessly cruel. He's, yeah. you know, and, 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 I, and I assume it can work that way under some circumstances where that actually boosts the perception of your power. I mean, dictators are masters of this. Yeah, you, you absolutely. And, and by the way, like if you study Trump's facial expressions and you Google, uh, you know, videos of Mussolini, it is like the, <laughs> I, I mean, it is stunning. There's this like narcissistic, did you like that one? Yeah, that was good. That was a good, you do an excellent Mussolini. That, that's the weirdest form of praise I've gotten in a while. But, um, but no, you know, absolutely. And here's what's really interesting. And I, and I think, um, you know, there has been some commentary on this, which is that we gravitate to different strategies of power um, and, and models of power depending on our context. So we're starting to do work showing, con contrasting uh, a collaborative model of power, cooperative model, or versus coercive, Machiavelli versus Aristotle, or whatever you would want to juxtapose. And, you know, the older you get, the more um, women tend to like the collaborative model a little bit more, certain kinds of, you know, sectors like collaborative model. And there are contexts where we like the bully, right? And, and this hasn't been studied in social psychology, but we know it's interesting that bullies and I think Trump, I think that's the best encapsulation of Trump's strat, strat style. Mm -hmm. Come out swinging, be offensive, get attention. It's what bullies do. Uh, bullies resort to that strategy because they largely are falling in power, right? Mm -hmm. they, they tend to have this weird role in groups where they're, everybody knows who they are and they're kind of losing their reputation. And they use this really, um, this very high, you know, pyrotechnic uh, bullying strategy to, to gain power usually fails. Hmm. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's a little reassuring. So you talked about this neighborhood you grew up in and you talk about this a little at the end yeah. of the book. And I gather um, <clears throat> what happened was, was it that your parents had been what graduate students in a kind of a reasonably nice neighborhood near UCLA? Yeah. And then one or both of them went to take a job at a college that led you to live in a very different kind of neighborhood, right? You want to, and this is relevant to the, 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 the note you end on. Yeah. Uh, and so why don't you talk a little about that? Thank you. Well, um, you know, my, my mom got her PhD in uh, 1970 at UCLA in literature. And, you know, this is before, you know, uh, shifts in property values. This is before the massive shift in inequality in the United States. And I think like a lot of Americans, I was power naive, right? I, I went to this school in Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles, um, had friends. And then in fifth grade, we move. And, and I love thinking about it now, as I say in the power paradox, because, you know, my parents uh, moved to a place that was rife with poverty, where no one went to college, where there are all kinds of kids ending up in prison. Uh, it, it was just... You know, and we moved to the poorest neighborhood in the entire county. Uh, and the thing, it was funny, you know, I was young, sorry to go on about this, but, you know, you know, the, 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 a family up the street, I mean, it was like Appalachia, right? They, no floorboards, dad was depressed, you know, massive dark circles, out of work, you know, kids get breaking bones, um, go down the road, the guy right next to us, lawnmower business, never made a cent, you know, lawnmowers all over the, and, and I love those people, uh, and the neighborhood, and it was warmer than anything, but, you know, they, they, so, so you mean they were, they were nice people, they were, they were, they were being nice to each other and so on, you mean? Profoundly nice, like just in and out of houses, dinners, tables, spots at the dinner table, but the thing that was really striking is, is I just felt like, uh, fate was not smiling nicely upon these people. Mm-hmm. People died young. They just literally start dying. Uh, kids, weird stuff happen. And what happened, Bob, um, now we know, and this is where I really end the book, and in a way, or I don't end it there, but it's one of the most important sciences to emerge, is we're now knowing, learning that if you feel 
disempowered, the stress system of your body, the cortisol response becomes hyperactivated. Your inflammation response becomes hyperactivated and it shaves six years of life expectancy off your life. You know, it is very, just damages cells, damages systems. And that's what was happening in my neighborhood that I didn't know about um, and why in part I did the science. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and has that affected your whole, uh, your politics, your ideology, your... Yeah, you know, um, you know, I think, I think uh, it, it, it really has. I mean, for one, I just, you know, it's so interesting to me, uh, you know, one of the, uh, obviously I got interested in social class and privilege because, mm -hmm. you know, that was a neighborhood that had very little and I came to understand why, you know, some of our work shows, lower class people share a lot more. And that made sense from that experience in the neighborhood. I got interested in um, how class hyperactivates physiological threat. And that came out of that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that just more politically, in terms of ideology, um, you know, I do feel like a, a mounting number of social scientists that inequality and poverty aren't local problems, they're national problems that affect the very nature of our psyche, right? That, uh, and you know, Wilson and Pickett on the spirit level, we're gathering a bunch of new data, um, Ichiro Kawachi at Harvard. Um, the, the fact that that part, uh, that that neighborhood exists in the US costs everybody, right? In a lot of ways that we should embrace and take on. Mm -hmm. But also relevant to ideology is something you mentioned in the book, which is that one's, one's place in the power structure influences one's view yeah. of why the power structure exists. In other words, why are these people poor? Yeah. You can say, well, it was just bad luck. Or you can say, well, no, they just don't have the grit and determination that I have. And yeah. I think people will not be shocked to hear that the finding is that, you know, the more, the higher you are in the hierarchy, the more likely you are to think that people's places in the hierarchy are in some sense what they deserve. That, that it's not just a bad roll of the dice. It's like everyone could be CEO of whatever if they just, if they would really apply themselves kind of. That, yeah. That's a, uh, almost a caricature of the view that prevails at the higher levels of society, but that's the basic idea, right? Yeah, and, and it gets more nefarious. I call them narratives of exceptionalism, right? Mm -hmm. That. You know, and it, and it is this interesting thing, you know, if, if we have this default tendency towards more equality, i.e. hunter-gatherer societies, i.e. around the world we share about 40% of resources we have, um, when you have dramatic inequality, the mind kicks into action and says, I got to explain this stuff. It's, it deviates from what a default assumption. And, you know, over time, um, you know, uh, the kinds of stories people tell to justify their position at the top are pretty stunning, right? You think about, and this came out of uh, 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 Carl Degler, who's a historian at Stanford, wrote this book. Um, God, you probably remember the title. It was about social Darwinism. Social Darwinism wasn't a scientific theory. It was a theory by well-to-do Victorian English people who, that said, our culture is the most sophisticated and the rest are savages, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that tendency of just people up high tend to think it really takes special people to make it up high permeates everything. It, it permeates how we look at poverty. It, it permeates the stereotypes of the poor, right? That they're lazy and just addicted to pleasure when in fact those aren't true. Um, and it really drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it's worth putting a spotlight on scientifically. So, so you're, hoping, you're hoping that that's one thing the book will do, I take it. <laughs> and here is the book. <laughs> the Power Paradox. The Power Paradox. Yeah, How I, we gain know. and lose influence. You actually, I mean, you, you, you said, you know, it's, it's very near the end of the book. You talk about that, your experience in that neighborhood. But then you have an epilogue, a five-fold five path to power. Should we, should we hold off on telling people what's in that so they'll, they'll have yet another reason to buy the book? Or do you feel like uh, summarizing well, the fivefold path to power? Well, you know, I guess one thing just to be thinking about is, you know, and I think they can, the epilogue is short, like 
you know, the, and vast and, and about ethics, um, which I think is important. And I think, you know, as I wrote this book, Bob, and, and thought about, you know, broad swaths of data on where we are, inequality, poverty, you know, all, as I was writing this book, Mike Brown, Freddie Gray, Eric Garner, you know, Ferguson happened. Uh, as I was writing this book, uh, new data on sexual harassment and violence on college campuses, just old forms of the abuse of power. Uh, really, it was really upsetting, frankly. And so I think um, we're in a period where things are getting a bit better in terms of power, but we need to get out of this Machiavellian model of, of what it takes to succeed and be a little and be a little bit more humble about our station and the good breaks that get us where we are. So I'll just leave that as okay. one of the five steps towards enduring power. It's a little bit of humility. Okay. I'm in favor of humility and certainly in everyone other than me and, and even and even in me. Um, so thank you. So so as we tape this, the publication date is tomorrow, which means that by the time this uh, our, our our dialogue is actually public, this book will have just been published. Great. Power Paradox, and uh, people can uh, can buy it. It's it's a great read. Really fascinating book. So thanks for thanks for taking the time, Dacker, and, and good luck with it. It's always good talking to you, Bob. Same here. Take care. All right.